I've got some free advertising here. I work at the Pony Museum, can you tell? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I work at the Pony Museum and I am a Pony Museum educator. So I suppose you're allowed to heckle me a bit because children tend to quite a bit. Um, when I asked them the other day, what do museum people do? They say, they look after old stuff. <laughs> oh dear. Well, technically that is what we do and I love it. Um, but yes, I said, if anyone looked at the descriptions, I said that I was going to look at how to deal with big concepts in a museum setting. That does sound very serious, but this is not going to be serious at all. There might be a few tips here if you're not an education person. If you are, I apologise if I'm repeating the obvious. Um, but the real thing here, I'm going to give it to you straight. You're all going to have to sing. Woo! <laughs> okay, his response is what I require. So in order to get you all to think about that, I have a prize. I have an incentive to make you sing. So first of all, before I even try and talk about anything museum-y, I would like everybody to do their biggest 80s style wail, like Wah! kind of noise. And whoever does the best one, okay, it's a good prize, it's a really good prize, is astronaut ice cream. <laughs> oh yeah, now this is amazing. It's like five pounds. So it's an expensive snack meal, well worth it. So if everyone for me now, I'm gonna count, count you down, one, two, three, wail. And I'm gonna be looking out for you. I can't really see you, so I'm gonna hope I can hear you. I want really good whales, because it's gonna just get worse from here for you. <laughs> Alright, so one, two, three. Woo! Anytime he wins. Okay. Well done. Would you like to come and get your prize? You, yes, you. Now I've realized I need to look. <laughs> now, I realise that I have used up a lot of my time um, getting people to wail, so I will briefly talk about what I was going to talk about. So, I am here to talk about how you talk about big concepts in museums, which is a strange thing to do because all museums deal with big concepts, but not all of them have necessarily got objects in museums to back them up. And I'm talking about things like climate change. Now, I've talked about climate change in schools and lots of other community group settings for about eight years now. And it's a really difficult thing to do because it's such a big thing that we try to parcel down into one small area. Um, and one thing that schools tend to do is go, okay, right, we're going to do recycling, and we covered it. Excellent. And in fact, when I tell people that I'm an environmental scientist, quite often what they do is automatically say, I recycle at home, <laughs> and get very, very defensive. Which, um, and I'm like, my lifestyle choice does not reflect on you. Um, but people get very defensive. We have these automatic suggestions in our head of how we feel about climate change. We have this guilt, fear, all these big things. So how do we deal with it? Well, how we deal with it is we break it down. Break it down. Okay. Um, we break it down. We break it down into pieces. So it isn't, aha, climate change. Recycling is the answer. Um, climate change is a big issue and has lots of component parts. So we'll talk about one thing. It might be waste usage and recycling, or it might be something like the thermohaline circulation. Does anyone know here have heard the term thermohaline circulation? Yes. Okay, so these are the people from my museum. Um, so yes, um, the thermohaline circulation is basically the circulation within the oceans that moves heat around based on the density of the seawater because of salt and heat. The, the thermo, heat, saline, is the, well, haline is the saline part. Um, and so part of this is how we talk about climate change. So that's the example I'm going to use today and something that you're all going to have to sing about in just a minute. Um, so after you break it down, what else do you do with big concepts? Um, DEFRA did a report, and I usually hate saying that phrase because it's usually a rubbish answer, but DEFRA did a report showing that people take on new information, especially things which are um, contrary to their own opinions at the time by being in a changing style of life at that point. So if they're getting married or if they're having a baby or they're moving house. So the key thing to do, put them in a state of change. If you can, bring them to a museum, we're already doing that, it's a new location. But how can we do that more? Well, one way we can do it is by doing something a bit silly and crazy. So one thing we did at the Pay Museum just a year ago, we put a beach outside the museum is a little bit crazy. I've done it twice now. I did it outside the Cedric as well. Um, now, what we did was we put sand outside the museum, 
and we talked about Cambridge upon Sea. And I have a lovely poster here as well, which I can show you later. I've got a bigger one as well, basically showing that if sea levels rise, Cambridge will be a seaside town. <laughs> Yay! Um, so it sounds quite depressing, but we did lots of fun activities. We had a beach, and we gave them something to focus on. Now, I haven't got much time left, so I was going to tell you all about blindfolds and how you can make people do jigsaw puzzles blindfolded. And so if you want to find out about that, you can by asking me afterwards. But the other thing I want to tell you is what else can you do? You can change the space, you can change the focus, you can give them something sensory to feel and concentrate on like an object. And that's what we're great at. We have lots of objects in museums. So a nice piece of Inuit art or something like that nice strokey thing, they're lovely. Ask these people over there, they love them. Um, and also give it a story. We have objects so that we can tell stories. So tell them a story. Um, we had a story about beluga whales being trapped in ice um, because of climate change. The ice hadn't melted around them, so they had nowhere to escape. So a whaling boat was called in and played lots of different types of music to convince the beluga whales to follow it along. They tried doing beluga whale music, didn't work. They tried doing symphony music, didn't work. They tried Johnny Be Good, didn't work. But then they tried chamber music and suddenly also went following them along. So you can in fact get a beluga whale to dance should you want to. And this is a way that my colleague Naomi, who's sitting over here, can persuade early year students to understand something as big as climate change in a very simple way. Now, we are about to do a song. We're about to do a song. It's a song that I have written myself with Axel Rose. <laughs> um, it's a climate change song. Um, when I was doing my masters, I obviously had far too much time, or I thought this was a good idea, one or both. Um, and I changed the lyrics to Sweet Child of the Mind to be about the thermo haline circulation. <laughs> so <laughs> we're about to have the lyrics put up here with the song. A couple of librarians in the Scott Player Research Institute have kindly provided a backing track. Um, so now, I want you to belt it out much as possible. The only thing I can give you advice is if you see the term THC, say it like the acronym, because it's referring to the thermohaline circulation. And also it goes, well, sweet. No, it doesn't go like that. That's how it actually sounds good. It goes, well, thermohaline, like that. But also, wail it. We don't want good voices. We want, yeah! kind of noises. Okay, right, we're going to go for it now. We're going to start. Okay. <laughs> I can sing with you, don't worry. <laughs> Oh, 
so much, so much to talk 